The character Ulysses we encounter in Tennyson's poem is not exactly the same one we know from the original recounted by Homer in the Odyssey. Ulysses, or Odysseus to give him his original Greek name, has spent ten years fighting in the Trojan War, followed by ten years undergoing a sequence of accidental adventures on his journey back home to Ithaca. The end of the Odyssey leaves him alive and victorious over his enemies at home. Nothing is said or hinted at of his eventual fate. For that, Tennyson has taken a version used by Dante in the 14th century and recounted in tw Canto 26 of the Inferno, where Ulysses is in the eighth circle of hell. Dante and his contemporaries had no access to the original Greek version of the Odyssey, but instead got their knowledge of it from Latin texts, notably the Aeneid of Virgil. Whereas the wiliness of Odysseus appealed to the Greeks, the Romans, who had a different set of values with regard to honour, took a less indulgent view of Ulysses, and Virgil described him as cruel, or deceitful, or a deviser of crimes. This goes a long way to explaining why a hero of the classical world such as Ulysses has ended up in Christian hell. It's because the very skills for which he was known, his fox-like cunning, his ability to convince and persuade people, the Trojan horse was one of his ideas, are, for Dante, sins. Ulysses is guilty of misusing his God-given talents by deceiving people and of shirking his responsibilities to his family when he finally goes off on his adventures again. Hence he is included with the evil counsellors who have been assigned to this particular area of hell. In Dante's variant telling of the story, Ulysses takes to the seas with his comrades again and is drowned. It's this aspect that appeals to Tennyson rather than the Christian moralistic one. Anyway, here it is in the words of Ulysses himself. When I departed from Circe, who beyond a year detained me there near Gator, ere Aeneas thus had named it, neither fondness for my son nor reverence for my aged father, nor the due love that would have cheered Penelope, could conquer in me the ardour that I had to gain experience of the world and of human vice and worth. I put forth on the deep open sea, with but one ship, and with that small company which had not deserted me. Both the shores I saw as far as Spain, far as Morocco, and saw Sardinia and the other isles which that sea bathes round. I and my companions were old and tardy when we came to that narrow pass where Hercules assigned his landmarks to hinder man from venturing farther. On the right hand, I left Seville, on the other, had already left Ceuta. O oh, brothers, I said, who through a hundred thousand dangers have reached the west, deny not to this the brief vigil of your senses that remains, experience of the unpeopled world behind the sun. Consider your origin. You were not formed to live like brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. With this brief speech I made my companions so eager for the voyage that I could hardly then have checked them. And, turning the poop towards morning, we of our oars made wings for the foolish flight, always gaining on the left. Night already saw the other pole, with all its stars and hours so low that it rose not from the ocean floor. Five times the light beneath the moon had been rekindled and quenched as oft, since we had entered on the arduous passage, when there appeared to us a mountain, dim with distance, and to me it seemed the highest I had ever seen. We joyed, and soon our joy was turned to grief, for a tempest rose from the new land and struck the forepart of our ship. Three times it made her whirl round with all the waters, at the fourth made the poop rise up and prow go down, as pleased another, till the sea was closed above us.